I worked um, five days in a row. I think it was in November. Every day I had a patient die. It's just awful. I'm Dr. Mark Laney. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Mosaic Life Care. We're going to talk about the coronavirus crisis. When we began to hear about this virus, and then we became aware that a national pandemic had been called, I think it was very uh, disconcerting. Every day, everyone was so scared about what were we walking into, what we didn't know. I remember people who sent their families away. Um, they sent their children and husbands away for a month, you know, whenever we thought maybe this was going to be more short term. You know, at first, you know, I was kind of hopeful that, well, maybe we locked out, maybe it's going to miss us, maybe it's just a bigger population, East Coast, West Coast issue. And when the pandemic actually hit our health system, we would turn a lot of floors to pandemic level floors to get them airborne isolation strengthen our supply chain to make sure we had all the PPE required for every single person. We knew that we had to take care of these people, no matter what. You know, your adrenaline and your response and the way you come into a shift, I thought at some point this would slow down, <laughs> and it hasn't. So it's just every day is dealing with significant coronavirus patients. And with COVID, it's one of these horrific things where you put your all into these patients and despite everything that you have done, it's never enough. The level of acuity of their care uh, has definitely constrained our resources, both mentally, physically, and as an organization. But this is something we chose to do. try and go in with um, a fresh mind. Uh, I'm hoping it's a good day. I'm hoping we are well staffed. I'm hoping, you know, we don't have a lot of sick patients and we can, um, we have the capacity to take care of them well, so. Please wear a mask. Temperature is normal. You have eight COVIDs over an A, one still in 59. So B has six patients, C has five patients. We have 64 open for COVID slash code. And then we have three patients over in Clipper and all are expected to move up today, as far as I know. Anybody have anything for me? All right, guys. So you gave labetalol times two. Times three. Out of an. Times two. I'm going home, okay? Aaron's back with you today. She was with you for a little bit yesterday when you came back down, when you came down here to the ICU. She's with you again today, okay? Ladies, you want to go play nurse? Have fun. So excited. Um, what do we have going on today? He already worked with PT. Mm-hmm. And eight is not now because... Did he get back. up? Yeah, he's out. Oh, cool. Okay, good. Um, eight's not going to get up. Um, seven has to talk to social work later. Uh, before COVID, we were two separate units. We were 32 med surge beds with a focus on post-op care primarily and that med surge level of care. We went from that population to being the lucky floor that was able to be set up with the ventilation to do negative pressure in all these rooms to having to learn about a disease that we've had less than a year of experience with. So it's been a lot of changing, a lot of growing, and having to do something that nobody on this floor signed up for. Always good to put it on, be, hear the air first. Uh, she is uh, uh, getting her stress test done now. She just got back. She's back. She came back. I'll, I'll keep an eye for her uh, reports uh, once I see them. So overall, we have 15 going, 16 going. 37. 
and 37 and 36 is already gone, right? Yes, 36 is gone. gone. Yes. We did have a plan between the three hospitals that we were going to be the clean hospital. All our COVID patients were going to be transferred south. There became more cases and the outbreaks and such that happened and so we had to really change our mindset. We are getting a new admission okay. and he is COVID positive so we will put him in room 21. One of the nurses was written down wrong, so I rearranged the schedule a little bit. So you're going to be a fourth nurse in uh, purple. There's a fourth nurse in blue. Oh, I'm going to grab a blanket. Oh, perfect. Okay. Cool. This is Haley, by the way. I'm, I'm so it's sorry. My granddaughter's name. Oh, I love it. <laughs> See, I already love her. We're going to be your nursing partners today. She has some shortness of breath, unfortunately. She's had it for about two weeks. Can I get you another blanket or anything? Good. Okay. I'm going to step out. I think a lot of it is learning to cope on the fly mm -hmm. and learning to, you know, I have to check myself before I go into this situation. Whereas, you know, before you may just run in like, let's go. Mm -hmm. You've learned a new kind of nursing through the pandemic, for sure. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think you put on all this stuff in one day? I don't. A lot. I think at least 12. <laughs> yeah, probably. That's like once an hour. Mm -hmm. Are you all done with breakfast? So we've already done all of our assessments today. We've done our meds, which by 10.30, we're like, we're rocking it out today. <laughs> How are you feeling? Um, just a little bit winded. Winded, okay. But really focus on those good draws of air in through the nose, mm -hmm. out through the mouth. Four rounds, but yeah, three. Alrighty, sir. Good. They all watched the game last night. Trying to give them a little bit of normalcy. I mean, you're stuck in a little bit of your room all day, sometimes weeks at a time. Some of them don't have family really to talk to. These patients have no one, except for the nurses, except for the techs, which they're super busy, and they can't stay in there as long as they want to. So I asked my boss, John, I was like, hey, listen, I've had COVID. There's people on the COVID floor. Can I go visit? And I come up here, um, just kind of say hi to the nurses, and, and I've got a list in my pocket, and uh, knock on the doors and visit if they want to. So this one gentleman's like, you know, I met my wife on a blind date, in December of 1970. And we just knew that we were meant for each other. So in April of 71, they got married. And he's sitting there and he's talking about, if I make it to April of 2021, that'll be 50 years. There was one lady, she looked pretty rough. And I said, listen, we don't have to talk. Um, if you want me to, we can just sit here and hold hands. I've been able to connect with 30 different people in basically 30 different ways. Hello. Okay. Temperature is 96.8. It is a struggle for a rural hospital because no, we're not getting slammed. We're not to full capacity as like the bigger cities were, but we are still seeing these patients and they are very sick. The patient can come in completely normal, walking, talking, and within 12 hours, they could be needing ventilator support. And then if we notice that there is a trend that this patient isn't doing well, and it's trending to where they're going to need higher care, we jump on the ball pretty quickly about getting them transferred down to St. Joe. We're a 94-year-old female patient coming from uh, Riverside Place. Uh, patient's on the COVID hall. She is COVID positive. No questions orders. I'm gonna see you in bed 12. Patient care has been a huge issue because it's increased, increased our volumes. Um, 
it's increased um, you know our resources that we've had to to bring in if you walked out on the other side of this there's a motion sensor on the other side where they would raise the other garage door to drive in and drop patients off and to see it change into this is it's just mind-blowing so, in some ways when this first started we thought that it would be over at some point so far it just continues to be a steady you know onslaught of coronavirus patients and it doesn't seem like it's slowing down x-ray is looking okay your back hurts here let's try to move you a little bit to make you more comfortable okay Is anybody still gowned up? Uh, I don't think so. What's up? It's really easy to walk in a room and not come out for 45 minutes. We turn, we go in like every two hours to turn the patient, you know, give medications, check your foleys, check the output, open the windows during the day, turn the lights on because your circadian rhythm doesn't in ICU delirium you want to make sure that you have clear days and nights when you're asleep for days on end weeks on end um, it's really really hard to figure out when you're supposed to be awake and asleep and some patients it's not appropriate to do it for I'm treating this guy like he's he's gonna walk out of here you know sometime soon so Get it. How's it going? This is going. Okay. It's going. You still have me on four liters? Yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. Okay. At 92, we're still off the oxygen, so that's good. Yeah. Still up walking around and... Oh yeah. I walked around for 45, 50 minutes. That's pretty good. Oh, that patient's dropping. Yeah, these monitors go off constantly <laughs> and we watch each other's oxygen, which that patient back there is not doing so well. But this dinging kind of, I don't know if you dream about it, but I know like I wake up and like swear I hear the monitors beeping. <laughs> How long have you been here? Um, my month of nursing was three days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. She's brand I'm, new. Why did you choose to be on the pandemic floor? If I was gonna work on the floor anywhere, it was gonna be here. And so, you just knew. there wasn't a job posting. I just happened to hear about it from somebody who heard it from somebody. And I emailed Aaron and I was like, I wanna I work there. Have a spot. And we started talking about it and he was like, well, what do you want? Do you want surgical? Do you want SSDU? And I was like, I want SSDU. And he was like, well, it's COVID right now. Nobody wants to work COVID. You know what, nobody wants to step up to the plate, <laughs> then I'm going to. It's it wouldn't be anything new for me. There's so much I could learn from it and I get to take care of the sickest patients. And it's true. I could do my most good here right now. Miss Margaret. Hi. Take a deep breath. Oh, that sounds good. You got some major good lungs. I used to yell a lot. Oh, well, you got two boys. Yeah. Is that why? Yeah. The chaplain came and saw you? Um, you think I need a chaplain? Well, he might. I don't know. Yeah, they come down. I don't know. They do once or twice a month. They don't come very often. They don't. They know who go to see and who not to. So they know not to see you? Uh -huh. You're too honorary for them? No, they're just wasting their time. <clears throat> oh, Margaret. We'll get you somebody here tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, I think Kim really can. I prefer a man. <laughs> a 
Okay, I'll send Jason in. We just got done meeting Miss Margaret, Miss um, Hysterical Margaret. Thankfully, she felt okay today. If she'd have had any problems or, you know, say say she was having trouble breathing, we would have we would have been able to manage that there with maybe an antibiotic or breathing treatments. I typically like to tell our um, our families that the inn is full. The hospital, you know, they were really really full. Um, that we needed to stay away from there as much as possible. Essentially, a typical day in the emergency department is where we have patients who are presenting here for non-coronavirus emergencies, so patients who are having heart attacks and having strokes and having sepsis, but we're also having patients who are here specifically for coronavirus and coronavirus-related uh, complications. Um, so a challenging day would be holding many ICU patients here at once, many patients in the hall, patients in the garage, basically patients anywhere we can put them. Um, and those days do happen. It's a constant triaging, um, and that's 24-7. Every day we do that. What we've had to do is open overflow, and then we've ha been at capacity, 28 is what we're at capacity, and you just do that constant triaging, and you're in close communication with the docs of those patients and saying, this is what we got, we have to accommodate, you know, and so that we don't have to turn people away. What would that say? Where are we going to put that patient? So they just call the code upstairs. They call anesthesia stat to 51 something. So we know it's a COVID patient. Anesthesia stat means that they're getting intubated. So down here, like since we hear that, we know that we have to start figuring out um, where the patient's going to go, what nurse is going to take it. Down here, those overhead pages mean a lot more than I ever thought they would. <laughs> when you get to the ICU with COVID, you are the worst of the worst. And um, your outlook is grim. Your chances are very minimal um, to survive the disease. And because the whole body starts to fail. Yesterday, she was really sad. Mm -hmm. I wanted to like stop all of her care and it's not getting any better. It sucks. There have been some that you just know every single one of these, you know, eight in this area are gonna die. Every single one of them. Like what keeps you, you know, what what's your North Star you all like this? I don't know. <laughs> some days I don't know. What else would I do? People need taken care of. I'm here. I'm here for a reason, you know? There's a reason why I was an ICU nurse during a pandemic. I don't know yet why, yeah, but um, I'll find it out eventually. I'll be, you know, I think all of us are wondering, like, what did I do to be an ICU nurse during a pandemic and nationwide, worldwide, you know, because I don't think anybody would sign up for this. They don't have a draft. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe, maybe we're put through this because something bigger than us knows that we're strong enough to do it. So I just kind of rely on that when I don't think I am. The psychological toll has been tremendous, uh, especially on our nursing staff, our physicians, our APRNs, our frontliner support services, individuals who are seeing people who are relatively healthy deteriorate within days and then die. When your shift ends, it still takes a few hours for you to cool down psychologically from an intense day. 
and that level of intensity is seen only in the battlefields and the front lines. You, you can't shed this. You never, I mean, I know, I know personally, I never stop thinking about it. I'm up late, I can't sleep. I know a lot of them have taken it home to their families. It's affected their home lives. I know a lot of them have nightmares about some of the things they've walked into doing here. We have counselors that talk to our providers weekly, but that still doesn't change the fact that you're dealing with month after month, week after week, with outcomes you know that are worse than 50-50 for the people uh, of advanced age that we're seeing. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some PTSD that comes out of this. I think one of the questions they're asking themselves is how long can I continue to do this? I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm so emotionally drained. And the 4U team is a group of, it's about 20 folks who are available to go and speak to uh, caregivers in times of stress. And this was happening prior to COVID and we were just kind of starting to build it. Well then, when the COVID piece hit, the 4U team became kind of the, the foundation, really, of emotional support for caregivers. The group gathers and they talk to each other about what's the worst part, what's the most difficult part. And the stories uh, just come pouring out. Well, there was a particular patient I had that came in in about July time frame, end of June, early July, and I got really close. I saw this patient on just a couple liters of oxygen be moved to BiPAP, watching the progression from that and how much he loved his wife, how much he wanted to go home and take care of her, and promising that I will do everything I can so you have that, um, to being intubated and paralyzed and um, there was a day where I spent eight hours straight in a papper, in a suit, trying to keep him alive. Day in and day out, you're talking with these family members that um, there's still hope, and um, you try to reflect that as the nurse, but in the back of your mind, it kind of eats at you because you know that it's not going to end well, and, the, and in most cases it doesn't. Like the death and dying part of it is obviously always included in ICU nursing because we're always going to have death and dying here, but it's just much more frequent now. The amount of people I've seen pass away in the last year is more than I think a person could say previous to COVID. Code blue, cat black from 1308. So we have this patient who is um, cognitively impaired, the sweetest, kindest soul you'd ever meet. You walk into his room, his face would light up. He was so excited to see you. He would like to spell things out, and he told me he loved, he, that he L-O-V-E me the mostest, and he missed me, and he went home that day. And we were so excited that he was going down the hallway, you know, doing one of these numbers, everybody high at him. And so I went home, and then I heard that he came back that night. The, the last day that before he died, he said, did you hear the bad news? And, and I said no, and he said he was going to go and sleep forever. He didn't want to sleep forever, he kept telling me. And so I sat there and held his hand, and you could just tell he wasn't the same. And I came out of a room, and I looked up at the monitor, and it said asystole. So I went running down there, and he was gone. And, it was tough. It still is, obviously. And there's been many. It's not the only one. It's just the one that hit me the hardest. And it's, I feel like every day, every day somebody either is dying or going to the ICU. My response is, first of all, to hear the pain and then to invite them to think about ways that they can care for themselves, all we have is each other and the support we can offer each other. Well, I think a lot of us were checking in on each other, asking how we're doing um, when we're not at work. I'll text her on my days off and I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> yesterday was awful, <laughs> but I'm glad we get to work together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, you have your days where you don't think you can come back tomorrow. Like, I just can't do it one more day. And then tomorrow you wake up and you come back and you do it again. I know I can't leave, they're my family. They're each other's brothers in arms, sisters in arms. They know this is where they're needed. They know this is where they can make a difference. I want people to understand how difficult this has been. 
for the people doing the work. Um, and it is real. <laughs> We're blessed in this community to have this hospital and these people. Um, and I mean, I'm talking again, the whole team, providers, chaplains, pharmacists, dietitian, everybody plays a role and is in this, to, we're in it together and that's how, what makes it happen. Um, and I don't know the answer. I really don't. We just don't know which way this will go, but we have hope every day. The Pfizer vaccine requires ultra low cold storage conditions between negative 70 to negative 80 degrees Celsius. We here at Mosaic do have monoclonal antibody treatments. So we have a, a monoclonal antibody treatment from Regeneron um, and one from Eli Lilly. The purpose of this treatment is essentially to prevent severe COVID disease in those who are at risk. Um, we've developed an infusion clinic here, um, and myself and Dr. Hunter are, and other physicians are taking calls, approving patients for monoclonal antibody treatment, and here at Mosaic we've had very good success. The goal is to prevent severe COVID disease. This is one of the pieces of equipment that we use to transport the vaccine, so it's a portable vaccine refrigerator. We will deliver this to the vaccination site, and then they'll be reconstituted right before administration. We're very excited about this, and we cannot give it out fast enough. Hi there. Second dose. Second dose, and your second dose as well? Okay. I got my first vaccination on 1223, so two days before Christmas, and yeah, just woke up with a sore arm on Christmas Eve and had a fine Christmas. I'm ready. Let's do this. All second right. vax. I wanted to do this because why not stop a horrible pandemic? Plus, I really want to see my grandpa. I haven't seen him since June. FaceTiming is not doing us justice. He's 89 years old. I only have so much longer with my last grandparents, so I really want to do this for him. This is the light at the end of the tunnel. Everything that happens in our lives is an opportunity for deepening of spirit, uh, offers opportunities uh, that are positive and that difficult times don't mean we just fall apart and are crushed. Sometimes we feel as if we're going to be, but how we incorporate our experiences of the past eight months and maybe the next eight months into who we are as persons will emerge in ways that will make us better people and more loving and more ready to embrace the pain of life as well as the, the goodness and the joy of life and realize that that's the whole package.